Good morning, my name is Kat Miller, and uh, we'd like to welcome you to Open Circle this morning. Please turn off your cell phones, and uh, maybe I'll remind you to turn them on, and maybe not. I think I should be able to take that out. David should give me permission. Why should I have to tell you to turn on your cell phones? You're adults, you're responsible people. <laughs> I know, it's a strange one. This morning's Open Circle mission statement is gonna be read by Wendy Peterson. Open Circle provides a supportive environment to gather for social interaction and to improve our understanding of ourselves, our community, and our world. Presentations span a wide range of intellectual, cultural, physical, and spiritual topics. We do not necessarily agree with the ideas and philosophies of our presenters. We encourage you to listen with an open mind and form your own opinions. My God, you can tell you're a, you're a star. <laughs> you seen her on the stage? Oh, you've got to. You've missed it if you haven't had a chance. If you aren't signed up on our email list and would like to be, you can do so under the tree. We have a clipboard. You can also go to our fabulous website, opencircleahiheek.org. While you're on our website, you can also uh, get the um, link to Chapala Drone, which is where our videos are now. All the things that Brad is taping are available rather quickly after the uh, after they're videoed, and um, they're all available free now. Things are going to be free, which is really a wonderful thing. Old ones are being uh, brought up to speed. We have um, many moons, seven years of videos. So anyway, you can do that at opencircleahiheek.org. You can also go to YouTube and look for Chapala Drone. So that's our new way to get videos, so it's pretty cool. Um, those of you here for the first time, we'd love it if you would stand up. We'd love to acknowledge you. It's not a bad thing. It's really simple. <laughs> Come on, up. <laughs> ah, welcome. Hey, chicken. My be one of my best friends won't stand up. Oh. <laughs> buck, 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 buck. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, that's what good friends are for, huh? Making you just feel like an idiot. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so also I want you to know that our financial statement, it was announced last week, Margaret announced it last week, that our financial statement is also on the, uh, the push board, pin board over underneath the tree if you'd like to look at what we do with our money and how much we bring in and where it goes and all those good things. Basically, you can see where it goes and how it's used. It's all right here, including the rent that we pay here and all for the technology and uh, cookies and sandwiches and coffees and teas and the stacking of chairs, and the rent to LCS, and watching our cars. A first grade girl handed in a drawing, you have to be quiet for this, a drawing for her homework assignment. I want to be like mommy when I grow up, she said. The picture appeared to be of a woman holding on to a pole while many stick figure people around her were trying to give her money. <laughs> the teacher graded it, and the child brought it home. She returned to school the next day with the following note. Dear Mrs. Davis, I want to be perfectly clear on my child's homework illustration. It is not of me on a dance pole on a stage in a strip joint surrounded by male customers with money. <laughs> I work at Home Depot and had commented to my daughter how much money we made in the recent snowstorm. The drawing is me selling a shovel. Sincerely, Mrs. Harrington. <laughs> You Canadians are going to love this. This is one for you. Okay, so this is an actual, this as far as we know to be true, this is an actual radio conversation of a U.S. naval ship with Canadian authorities off the coast of Newfoundland in October 1995. The radio conversation was re released by the Chief of Naval Operations. Canadians. Please divert your course 15, 15 degrees to the south to avoid a collision. Americans. Recommend you divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid a collision. 
canadians. negative, you will have to divert your course fifteen degrees to the south to avoid a collision americans, this is the captain captain of a u s. navy ship, i say again divert your course canadians, no, i say again divert your course Americans, this is the aircraft carrier USS Lincoln, the second largest ship in the United States Atlantic Fleet. We are accompanied by three destroyers, three cruisers, and numerous support vessels. <laughs> I demand that you change your course 15 degrees north. I say again, that's one five degrees north, or countermeasures will be undertaken to ensure the safety of this ship. Canadians, this is a lighthouse, your call. <laughs> So apparently we've, we've been arrogant at least since from 1995, us Americans. <laughs> How we got it? We're good? Okay. Let me just give you our words of wisdom today. Maybe you saw this in the paper this last week. Very touching. My dear, thank you for just being alive. This was said by Huang Wu-sek, 89, who fled South Korea during the Korean War and was re briefly reunited last week with his 71-year-old daughter in the North. My dear, thank you for just being alive. Next week's presentation, Quarteto Hanes, the distinguished quartet of young musicians from Guadalajara is making their second appearance at Open Circle. They were formed in July of 2016 under the direction of maestro Christopher Wilshire with the intention of raising Mexican chamber music to a higher level. Despite having been recently formed, they have already participated in several prestigious international festivals. Their musical program will be announced by them when they get here next week. If you happen to see them before, it is fascinating because Christopher Wilshire leads them through basically what a lesson looks like and the nuances of how he picks music. No, I'm wrong. It's a concert. Never mind. I don't know very much, and I like to make stuff up. And this, this, is, this is one of those times when I have been caught. Thank you for your indulgence. So now, of course, we need our centering moment. Barbara Hilt is leading us in our centering moment today. You know a lot. <laughs> OK. Good morning. So this morning, we're going to try something a little different for our centering moment. We're going to listen to a piece of music that is about two minutes long. So as you listen, I invite you to uh, relax and maybe uh, coordinate your breaths with the tempo of the music and see how that is for you. So.
Thank you and enjoy the day. Okay. This week's presentation, Then and Now, and What If, presented by Rachel McMillan. Most of us think that history is a record of the past. In fact, the definition of the word is a continuous, systematic narrative of past events as relating to particular people, country, period, person, etc. We also know that history not only influences the present, how we think, how we react, what we believe, but also the future. But what if the history we know is not true? What if the history consists not of facts, but of a collection of stories we tell about the past? Rachel McMillan was born in England, raised in Australia, and spent three years in Greece before moving to Canada in 1968. She is the author of the popular Dan Connor mystery series published by Touchwood Editions. It's here in the library, isn't it? It's at LCS, it's here as well as available to buy. Previous nonfiction, poetry, and freelance articles have appeared in such publications as Wright, World Books, Pacific Yachting, BC, Outdoors, Grey Zine, Season Magazine, and of course, the Ojo de Lago. Please welcome, join me in welcoming Rachel McMillan. <laughs> She's famous here. <laughs> Thank you, Kat. And good morning to each and every one of you and to all my relations. So, then and now, what was and what is? The past and the present. And that's the story, of course. The past is the story of our history, where we came from, who we are. It's immutable, it's unchangeable. That's what we believe. You've heard the sayings, you can't change history. You must learn from the past. Those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And whether we liked history in school or hated it, or whether we went on to study more of it in college, the reality is that all of us are affected by it because what we have learned has in large part determined how we see our world today, how we interpret the news, how we look at other cultures and our own. As an example, I'm sure we all have some image in our heads of what North America was like before the white man arrived. I know I have, and I didn't grow up in North America. That image comes mostly from our days in school, when the foundation of what we now accept as fact was first laid. That was a time when we were too young to question anything. And we were taught one thing or another, and it has, without need to re-examine it, it has become belief. And that belief has since been fed by the books we've read, by the games we've played, by the movies we've seen. But what if some of that history, and I'm talking especially about modern history now, maybe back 500 years, what if some of that history we learn from is wrong? How does that affect our perceptions? It's an interesting question and one I think we should all ask ourselves. Let's start by looking at the story of Christopher Columbus. That's pretty innocuous. <laughs> we all know who he is, right? He's the Italian who sailed for Spain, Queen Isabella. He's the one who in, 19, in 1492 sailed across the ocean blue. Not only does he have a poem to celebrate his achievement, he also has a US federal holiday named after him. He's the European discoverer of what is now known as the United States of America, right? Well, no, he's not. In fact, Christopher Columbus never set foot in North America. He was an explorer, that much is true, and he made four separate trips the first one started in 1492. He landed in Cuba, which he thought was an island off the coast of China. He landed on three different Caribbean islands, most of which are now a part of Bermuda. And um, he also landed on Hispaniola, where Haiti and the Dominican Republic now are. 
He explored the coast of Central and South America, but he never once came further north. Now, other parts of the story we've learned to believe are also untrue, although they are really unimportant in the scheme of things. He did have three ships, but they weren't called La Nina, La Pinta, and La Santa Maria, although that may have been nicknames. And uh, he wasn't trying to prove the Earth was round, because they already knew that as early as the 6th century BC, when Pythagoras, your friend of Pythagorean triangles and all that stuff, wrote about it in a book called The Sphere. In fact, dear old Christopher owned a copy of Ptolemy's Geography, written, in thir uh, written 1,300 years before he set sail, which documented very clearly that the Earth was known to be round. But let's forget about Christopher, because he really, in terms of how we see things today, he's unfortunately, sorry Chris, unimp unimportant. Um, and let's move forward 100 years or so to another story, Pocahontas. We all know that one too, right? Disney even made a movie of it. Pocahontas, a real person, born in 1598, and remember the date, was a beautiful Indian maiden, daughter of a chief, who fell in love with Captain John Smith and saved his life by laying her own head over his to prevent his execution. Aww. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? Well, part of the story of Pocahontas is true. She was the daughter of an Indian chief. She did spend a great deal of time with the English because she was captured by them and held ransom. She converted to Christianity. She married a tobacco planter called John Rolfe, not John Smith. She bore him a son, and together they traveled to England where she died when she was only 20 or maybe 21. So where does John Smith fit into that story? Well, maybe he doesn't. Here's the thing. Our friend John was an adventurer. He was an explorer and a soldier. And he's responsible not only for his role in the exploration of the New World, but also for the settlement and even the survival of Jamestown, England's first permanent colony in America. Not a bad resume, right? But it seems John, who was born in 1580, remember the date again, needed more than that. Turns out that by 1607, the year he was supposedly captured by the Powhatan, a tribe of Indians to which Pop Pocahontas, or Mateoka as she was actually called, belonged, he had already found himself in a number of similar situations. In Turkey, he was rescued from a gruesome death by the beautiful lady Traga Bigzanda. <laughs> when he was in Russia, the lady Kalamata kind of like the olive, but with two L's, <laughs> came to his aid. And in France, la belle Madame Chanoyez stepped up to prevent his early demise. <laughs> Lucky guy. <laughs> and if that isn't enough to make the story hard to believe, then the dates add just a touch of difficulty. Remember I told you to remember the date? Bet you didn't. Well, in case you forgot, Smith was born in 1580. Pocahontas was born in 1598. At the time of her supposed meeting with our hero in 1607, Captain Smith would have been around 27 years old. Pocahontas would have been nine. Doesn't seem too likely, does it? But let's leave Pocahontas as well, because Neither what we believe about all Christopher or what we believe about Pocahontas really has much of an influence on our lives. Let's move to a little more recent history. Has anyone here visited the town of Almo in Idaho? Me either, and I can't say it's high on my bucket list, but um, <laughs> it's a small, unincorporated town of about 200 people located in southern Idaho. I believe it's in the county of Cassis. There's a plaque there, right in the center of town, which reads, and I quote, dedicated to the memory of those who lost their lives in a most horrible Indian massacre, 1861. 300 immigrants westbound, only five escaped erected by the sons and daughters of Idaho pioneers in 1938, unquote. 
wow, 295 killed. Now that's a massacre. Indians didn't generally kill that many whites at one time. The Lachine massacre in Quebec in 1689 killed around 90. The Indian Creek massacre in Illinois in 1832 listed 18. The 1854 Ward Massacre along the Oregon Trail recorded 19 white folks killed. In fact, in almost every instance, whites were far more successful at massacring Indians than Indians were at massacring whites. As an example, in 1598, in what is now New Mexico, soldiers killed over 800 Acoma Indians and cut off the left foot of every remaining man over 25. Now that's really a massacre. But back to Alma, 300 people in a wagon train, 295 killed, only five survivors, one of them an infant. It's a great story, a great Western gut wrencher worthy of John Wayne. The only problem is it never happened. Historian Brigham Madsen revisited the story in 1993. He researched all the newspapers of the time the Desert News in Salt Lake City, the Sacramento Daily Union, the San Francisco Examiner, and he found no mention of any white man dying at Indian hands, let alone a massacre of 295. He then went on to search the National Archives and the records of the Bureau of Indian Affairs for the various states and territories. Nothing. Not even a report of the supposed five survivors. Well, okay, one of them was a baby, so four survivors. Who you would think would bring something as horrific as that to the attention of the authorities. Nothing. In fact, there's no mention of the event at all until some 66 years after the fact, when a man named Charles S. Walgamot put out a book called Reminiscences of the Early Days, where he attributes the story to one W.M. Johnson. Turns out the story is simply a tale someone made up and told to someone else. And because it's a dramatic tale, complete with bloodthirsty Indians and a brave white woman who crawls to safety carrying her nursing child in her teeth, mind you, in the original story. <laughs> it's a right proper Western, in fact. It grew in popularity and became historical fact. Even after it was discredited and the people of Almo were informed the town was reluctant to remove the marker, defending it as part of the culture and history of the area. <laughs> Which, of course, it is. What it isn't is true. But how do you think that fake history influences the perceptions of the people who have grown up in Almo or who visit Almo? How does it subtly shape their attitude towards the original people of America? Are there other inaccurate historical facts that we have come to accept as the truth and that influence our beliefs? Well, of course there are. Many of them, in fact. So many that it would seem that much of what we think of as history appears to be simply a collection of stories, mostly about famous men and celebrated events, with perhaps a couple of exceptional women thrown in every now and then, um, that together portray a carefully chosen yet conservative narrative about who we are and how we got here. To put it as George Orwell did so eloquently in his book, 1984, the past was erased, the erasure was forgotten, the lie became the truth. Those words of fiction have in many ways become fact, but how does it happen? I think the answer is because of those incorrect preconceived ideas we have in most cases created by what I like to call fake history. <laughs> How many of us here today have been asked why we like living here in Mexico? Pretty well everyone, right? And how many of us have answered, at least in part, that we love the Mexican culture? I know I have, and I do. But what's really interesting to me, when I stop to think about it, is that the Mexican culture is largely an indigenous culture. Far more than either the USA or Canada, or Australia for that matter, 
the indigenous culture of Mexico has influenced almost every aspect of modern Mexican life. Mexico officially recognizes 60 different indigenous languages. That's 60 more than either the USA or Canada or Australia. In fact, every year at the Maestro del Arte, which by the way is held in Chapala every November, I hope you'll all come, several of the 85 or more amazing traditional artists that are brought in from all over Mexico speak neither Spanish nor English. So if we love indigenous culture in Mexico, how can we largely ignore it or dismiss it in the USA and Canada and Australia? In fact, most of our ideas about indigenous culture have developed from what is now known officially as Holmberg's mistake. So who was Holmberg and what mistake did he make? Well, in 1940, a young doctoral student named Alan Holmberg decided to base his thesis on a group of indigenous people living in the Beni region of Bolivia. He spent two years there living among the Syria No and he subsequently published his account of their lives in a book called Nomads of the Longbow. The Syria No, he reported, were, and I quote, among the most culturally backward peoples of the world. Living in constant want and hunger, they have no clothes, no domestic animals, no musical instruments, no art or design, and almost no religion. They could not count beyond three or make fire, merely carrying a burning torch from one camp to another. Their poor lean-tos, made of haphazardly heaped palm fronds, were ineffective against rain and insects." Unquote. Now don't get me wrong, Holmberg was a careful and compassionate researcher, and his detailed observations of Syria no life still remain valuable. In fact, after his return, he became head of the anthropology department at Cornell University. Nonetheless, he was wrong about the Syria no. Wrong in a way that is very instructive and wrong in a way that has given his name to a mistake made many times over since then and in fact before then. The Syria no Holmberg studied were among the most culturally impoverished people on earth. But his mistake was in believing that they had always been that way, when in fact it was because smallpox and influenza had laid waste to their villages in the 1920s. Before the epidemics, at least 3,000 Syriano, and probably many more, lived in eastern Bolivia. By Holmberg's time, fewer than 150 remained, a loss of more than 95% in less than a generation. And those numbers hold true, by the way, for many of our uh, indigenous tribes in Canada and North America. And even as the epidemics hit, the group was fighting the white cattle ranchers who were taking over the region. The Bolivian military aided the incursion by hunting down the Syrian O and throwing them into what were, in effect, prison camps. Those Syrian O released from confinement were forced into servitude on the ranches. The wandering people Holmberg traveled with in the forest had been hiding from their abusers. It was just as if he had come across refugees from a Nazi concentration camp and concluded that they belonged to a culture that had always been barefoot and starving. That was Holmberg's mistake. Go back a few hundred years, exactly the same thing applied to the indigenous people of North America, and exactly the same mistake was made. Colonial descriptions of initial encounters with Native Americans are among the very few glimpses we have of Indians whose lives were not shaped by the presence of Europeans. From the records of those early colonists, we know 6th century New England housed 100,000 indigenous people or more, a figure that was slowly increasing. The Indians on the rivers and coastline didn't roam the land. Instead, most moved between a summer place and a winter place, kind of like affluent snowbirds. <laughs> Homes were formed from arch poles lashed together into a dome that was covered in winter by tightly woven rush mats and in summer by thin sheets of chestnut bark, 
a fire burned constantly in the centre, the smoke venting through a hole in the centre of the roof. The English colonists didn't find this arrangement peculiar. Chimneys were just coming into use in Britain at the time, and most homes there, including those of the wealthy, were still heated by fires beneath central roof holes. Nor did the English regard the houses as primitive. Colonist William Wood stated their multiple layers of mats, which trapped insulating layers of air, were, and I quote, warmer than our English houses, unquote. The houses were also less leaky than the typical English wattle and daub house, and Wood didn't conceal his admiration, stating that the Indian mats, quote, deny entrance to any drop of rain, though it come both fierce and long. And although the colonists bemoaned the lack of salt in the Indian cuisine, they thought it nourishing and considerably better than the usual in famine-wracked Europe. Pilgrim writers also universally reported that Indian families were close and loving, more so than English families, some thought. And sure, now and then slain foes were scalped, but that was much like British skirmishes with the Irish, which sometimes finished with a parade of Irish heads on pikes. In other words, the Indians who inhabited what was to become the United States of America were in many ways more advanced than the colonists. Does that image match the one you had before? It certainly doesn't match the one I had. Yet for almost five centuries, Holmberg's mistake, in other words, the supposition that the indigenous people of both the southern and northern continents lived in a culturally impoverished state, has held sway in scholarly work, and from there has fanned out to our high school textbooks which have, according to Francis Fitzgerald, who conducted a survey of US history school books, moved resolutely backward in their characterization of Indians. And that, of course, explains the portrayal of Indians in Hollywood movies and romantic adventure books, and even in newspaper articles. If a director or a writer grew up like us, believing what he or she had been taught and had no personal experience to the contrary, why would they do or say anything different? To give you an example of how insidious those early beliefs can be, US historian George Bancroft, dean of his profession, argued in 1834 that before Europeans arrived, North America was, and again I quote, an unproductive waste. Its only inhabitants a few scattered tribes of feeble barbarians destitute of commerce and of political connection." Unquote. Four decades later, Samuel Elliot, Elliot Morrison, twice a Pulitzer Prize winner, closed his two-volume European Discovery of America with the claim that Indians had created no lasting monuments or institutions. They were, and I quote again, pagans expecting short and brutish lives void of any hope for the future." Unquote. Both were wrong, but both have helped create our own distorted beliefs. Now, it's always easy for those of us living in the present to feel superior to those who lived in the past. But new disciplines and new technologies have created new ways of examining the past. And now, after several decades of discovery and debate, a new picture of the Americas and their original inhabitants is emerging. Clark Erickson, an archaeologist with the University of Pennsylvania, now regards the landscape Bolivia's Syria no created as, quote, one of humankind's greatest works of art, a masterpiece that until recently was almost completely unknown. Beginning as much as 3,000 years ago, this long ago society created one of the largest and most ecologically rich artificial environments on the planet. These same people, remember 150 destitute people, built up the mounds still visible from the air for homes and farms, constructed causeways and canals for transportation and communication, created fish weirs to feed themselves, and burned the savannas to keep them clear of invading trees. A thousand years ago, their society was at its height. Their villages and towns were spacious, formal, 
and guarded by moats and palisades. In Ericsson's reconstruction, as many as a million people may have walked the causeways of eastern Bolivia in their long cotton tunics, heavy ornaments dangling from their wrists and their necks. Yet by 1940, Holmberg, a careful and meticulous researcher, found these same people to be the most backward people on Earth. To me, that begs the question, how many other civilizations have been lost and how much knowledge has gone with them? Perhaps even more importantly, is there a way that we today can preserve the civilization whose destruction we ourselves have played a part in? A civilization whose remnants still hold a store of knowledge that in this time of climate change, overcrowding and chemical pollution might just be what this planet needs to survive. At the time of Columbus, the great majority of Native Americans were not nomadic, but built and lived in some of the world's biggest and most opulent cities. Far from being dependent on big game hunting, most Indians lived on farms or harvested fish and shellfish. The Americas were immeasurably busier, more diverse, and more populous than researchers previously imagined, and much, much older, too. Imagine for a moment a completely impossible journey, taking off in a plane in 1000 AD and flying a surveillance mission over the Western Hemisphere. What would be visible from the windows? We would see the, town, the cities and the towns of the Olmec, who invented a dozen different systems of writing, established widespread trade networks, tracked the orbits of planets, created a 365-day calendar that was more accurate than its contemporaries in Europe at the time, recorded their histories in accordion-folded books of fig tree bark paper. Arguably their greatest intellectual feat was the invention of zero, a turning point in mathematics, science, and technology, which didn't appear in Europe until the 12th century when it came in with the Arabic numerals that we use still today. We would see Kalakmal, the Maya city that covered as much as 25 square miles and had thousands of buildings and dozens of reservoirs and canals. The Maya were world pioneers in mathematics and astronomy and their, home, their realm was home to one of the world's most intellectually sophisticated cultures. And what of the rest of Mesoamerica? As the flight continues north, we see the city-states of the Mixtec and the Zapotec. Further north are the Toltec, sweeping in every direction from the mile-high basin that today houses Mexico City. Continue the flight to what is now the U.S. Southwest, past desert farms and cliff dwellings, to the Mississippian societies in the Midwest. Not long ago, archaeologists with new techniques unraveled the tragedy of Cahokia, near modern St. Louis, which was once the greatest population center north of the Rio Grande. Construction began in about 1000 AD on an earthen structure that would eventually cover 15 acres and rise to a height of about 100 feet, higher than anything around it for many, many miles. Continue north again to the least settled land, supposedly portrayed in countless US history books and Hollywood westerns. The Great Plains were remote and thinly populated, and the indigenous people there had no massive temples, although they did leave behind about 50 rings of rock that are very reminiscent of Stonehenge. Their trading network, however, was complex and far-reaching. By 1000 AD, trade relationships had covered the continent for more than a thousand years. Mother of Pearl from the Gulf of Mexico has been found in Manitoba, and Lake Superior Copper in Louisiana. In short, by 1000 AD, Indians had created a panoply of diverse civilizations across the hemisphere. 500 years later, when Columbus sailed into the Caribbean, the indigenous and the European world collided with overwhelming consequences. What was before 1492 
a thriving, stunningly diverse place, a tumult of languages, trade and culture, a region where tens of millions of people loved and hated and worshipped, as people do everywhere, was all swept away in subsequent years by disease and subjugation. So complete was the erasure that within a few generations, neither conqueror nor the conquered knew that this world had existed. We are all justifiably proud of the civilization that we have created. The Syriano, the Olmec, the Maya, the Mixtec, the Aztec, and the Zapotec would have been certainly equally proud of theirs. And there's absolutely no reason to think that the Apache, the Sioux, the Navajo, the Cheyenne, excuse me, <coughs> the Aleut, the Ojibwe, the Haida, Kwakutl, Salish, Iroquois, to name but a few, had any less reason for pride in what they created. It all makes you wonder what people will think of us a few thousand years down the road, doesn't it? Thank you. Wow. <laughs> I can get that out. <laughs> Thank you so much. Mm. You are welcome. So if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand. A mic will be brought to you. And then if you would stand up, hold the mic close to your mouth and ask your question. We like more questions than we like commentary, though sometimes we indulge just a little bit. Otherwise, I do like <laughs> motions like this. So anybody like to ask a question right up here? With... <laughs> With your thesis, which I, I agree with it and admire, um, how, how do I say this? How can you, or have you, studied religion with this in mind? To some extent, but not in any, any depth. I, I find myself blessed in some ways, um, because in Australia, when I went to school, we could not graduate from grade 12 without a compulsory subject called religious studies. And it wasn't based on the spirituality of each religion, it was based on the history um, and the theories behind it. So that was kind of a, a basis. And then my mother, being my mother, uh, <laughs> uh, she had espoused the, the Buddhist philosophy, but she insisted that her children get exposed to every religion. So my sister and I were sent to a variety of boarding schools that ranged from pretty well every religion you can imagine, except possibly Sikh. Um, but on the other hand, my husband and I got married in India, so. <laughs> Back here. Um, then, that was yeah. absolutely wonderful. I hope you publish it. If not, I would like to see you do it. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I've done a little this song. Yeah. Uh, the reading that I've done, and also having lived in Australia, mm -hmm. and also um, on Cape Cod, um, I've discovered that Christianity is, is a ruse as far as why people have tried to control mm. other cultures. Um, can I just say something about the Australians? That the, those early settlers, uh, hunted the aboriginal mm. people, thinking of them as animals to be hunted mm -hmm. and slaughtered. Yes, they did. And that the Australians today, the ones that I've known um, and having lived there, will not recognize that they re Would you comment on that kind of stuff? Um, I think Australia, of all the, um, how can I put the white colonies, um, treated their native people uh, most harshly. Uh, until 19, I believe it was 1988, it might have been in the 90s, uh, they classified Aborigines as flora and fauna. Oh my God. Uh, they had, like Canada, like the US, Australia had residential schools that were particularly vicious. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen The Rabbit Proof Fence. Oh yeah. If you haven't, it, it's a brilliant movie. Um, there are, as, as there are in, in uh, each of those countries, um, there is some movement going on. Um, it, it's, it has been fairly token, but there is some movement uh, going on towards reconciliation. Um, you know, 
larger reserves have been cre created in Australia. Um, treaties are being signed in Canada. Uh, reconciliation process is starting in Canada. Um, I don't know that there's a lot happening in the US, but uh, it's going to take a long time to heal the wounds. Christian. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not Christian. <laughs> okay. Over here, up, up, here, in, the up here in the gazebo. Way yes. back in the gazebo. Uh, thank you, Rachel. You, I want to thank you, especially for the question you raised and asking you for more comments about it when you said, how can we help preserve what we have been part of destroying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think we each have to answer that individually. I think most of us, most of the people that I talk to or travel with have a particular view when they go into, for instance, a reserve, whether it be a, a native reserve on, in Canada or in the States, certainly in Australia. Um, and I think we have to examine our own conscience as to what that reaction is and how we deal with it uh, and, and start respecting other cultures. But I think it's a very individual process. Anybody else? Right over here, here. Um, yeah, former teacher. Just uh, where are we at either in Canada or in the States in terms of rewriting our history books and who might be providing some leadership in that area, <laughs> if you're aware of any? Uh, in the United States, I really can't answer. Um, Canada has for many years, unfortunately, um, I think, used American history books because it was easy. They were already published. Um, in fact, <laughs> you know, my husband used to argue about some of the things my children learned because they were American dates. So Canada um, is only just starting developing not so much new history books, but, but actually native schools, which have their own curriculum. Uh, First Nations, as we call the indigenous people of Canada, uh, have input into that curriculum. And so it will be told more from their point of view. Uh, in Australia and, and the States, I really can't answer. Australia has always published its own books, um, its own textbooks. Um, whether or not that's improving, I don't know. I haven't been back you know, and, and looking at the school system for a while, but it certainly should. And over here? Oh, you're not raising your hand? I think no? there's one, okay. there's one right over, over here. here. Just in, in answer to your question about textbooks, I lived for many years in Texas, which has the most school children in the country. And at that time, now I left Texas in 1990, so hopefully it has changed. But at that time, so as, as Texas went, so went the rest of the country. So I will leave that to your imagination. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, right there. Harriet. Rachel, do you know what Mexican children are taught about uh, the things you were talking about? You I do not. I do not. I would really love to go into one of the local schools and see to what extent. The very fact that many of the artists come in speaking only their native language uh, pleases me because obviously it's maintained their culture. Uh, many of them come in wearing their traditional dress. Um, and I, I think that is, that is wonderful. Now, many of them live in very remote villages. So I'm assuming that whatever schools are in those villages teach in their language and are obviously embracing their culture. Whether that spreads outside of that, I don't know. Are there any Mexican folks here who can answer that? Raul. Oh, Raul's here. OK, we'll take this question, and then we'll come to you, Raul. Sure. Okay. Ah. I'm curious, for us gringos who um, know little about indigenous cultures here locally, do you have specific suggestions for what we can do to be more respectful of, more supportive of indigenous cultures in our locale? Um, I think you'll find that there are several uh, groups and organizations who are starting to put on uh, courses, including LCS, by the way, um, that expose us, if we wish to join the courses, to indigenous culture. Um, and there are more and more Mexicans involved in LCS, uh, so we can get to know them and get to know. There's also a couple of um, things I've seen advertised on, on or promoted on Facebook recently that are to do with um, 
indigenous trips, indigenous culture, learning about the indigenous way of life. Um, I, th I think the most important thing always is to start where we're at and simply to embrace every Mexican we see, talk to them, um, be very welcoming, you know, be very grateful for the fact that they're sharing their world with us. But again, I think it starts right at, at base level. Raul? Well, in answer to um, what we Mexicans are informed when we are kids, uh, we are very aware of the glorious past that we had. We, uh, we are taught about different cultures, so many, so many, and so varied. Uh, but as, as we move to, towards most, more modern history, uh, things start to be a little more mixed with religion, of course, you know, since the conquest, uh, things started to, to, to be told, let's say, by the Spaniards, right? So that's, that's the world's history, you know? History is written by the winners. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> okay, oops, Gloria. David, David probably knows how to find you. <laughs> <He'd> better. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Um, have you heard of the book Lies My Teacher Told Me? I've heard of it. I have not um, read it. It was, uh, when it originally came out, they tried to ban it in Mississippi because it had a photograph of a lynched black person, mm. but it was still published. So you might want to check that out. Lies yeah. My Teacher Told Me. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you can turn on your cell phones, I remembered, so what the hell, I'm telling you. Please stack your chairs, pick up your coffee cups, take your shawls, purses, jewelry, your shoes is a good idea. Anything else? And take your conversation outside. We'd appreciate Thank it. Thank you.